Hey everybody, welcome back to weekly. No, damn it. <laughs> hey creeps. Oh, we have a thing now. That's our thing. Oh, I didn't know that. How are you this week? Well, that's different. <laughs> a lot better now. Foot's all back to normal. Yeah, I uh, got these special shoes now. Um, that I use for walking. Doctor recommended. Shoes for walking, eh? Yeah, shoes for walking for my sprained ankle. Not that I'm walking on my ankle, but it lessens the pain in my ankle. I don't know why I had to des to describe that. <laughs> right on. Uh, my work environment has taught me that over explaining and over communication, um, that there's no such thing as that. So there you go. Cool. Yeah. Are you ready for some spooky entertainment? Yes, please. Okay. My sources this week are altereddimensions.net, ghostwatch.net, teladiario, a television española newscast from 1992. That's what that is. Cool. I think it's an ongoing thing. Paranormalscholar.com, periergaia.org, and... Mundo Parapsychologico dot com. How do you say sec secrets in Spanish? Secretos. De Ultratumba. Secretos de Ultratumba. Yep. Okay. Okay. You're doing your best. If so no one's told you today that they appreciate you, Adam, I appreciate you. Thank you. So this is the story of. Estefania Gutierrez Lazaro. Okay. An 18 year old girl from Madrid, Spain. Seemingly normal, she had six siblings. They lived in an apartment in Calle Louis Marin. Calle means street. Yeah. Okay. So it's Louis Marin Street. So her name is Estefania? Yeah. Okay. I have a friend named Estefania. What's up, Estefania? So she had. This is. Again, going back to 1992 or something like that. And there was lots of varying reports on this. It seems like all the good stories have many liberations taken on them. Is that a word? Is that the way to say it? Yeah. So I'm saying that she was 18 at the time. Okay. But I did read that she was 14, 16, 15. Nearly. Liberties. They're taking liberties. That's what it is. Yeah, stories being, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> but as far as I can gather, she was born in 1973. So this is 1991. So she was 18. I'm saying she's 18. Okay. Anyway, had recently become interested in the occult and spiritualism. As you do. Yeah. Like At 18. A normal kid. Yeah. So her parents say that she they had seen her reading several books on these subjects. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and say this girl could have been reading anything from... Twilight. Well, it's 1991, so I was going to say Lord of the Rings. Oh. But yeah, you know what I mean? Anything. Anne Rice. She was probably reading Anne Rice. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, and her Catholic parents were like, this was the occult. Yeah. <laughs> like, interview for a vampire had come out around that time, right? Yeah, probably. Well, anyway, one day while she was at school, she decides to play with a Ouija board. As you do. Yep. And again, as far as I can gather, it was in the bathroom at school. That's so and fucking sick. I know. As far as I can figure out, I think it was a homemade Ouija board. Nice. Yeah. And they used a small glass as a planchette. So they were trying to get in touch with one of the, there was two other girls. They were trying to get in touch with one of the girl's boyfriends who had recently died in a motorcycle accident. Whoa. Yeah. So. Wait, this kind of sounds like the premise of that movie, Veronica, from Netflix. This is the premise of the movie, Veronica, from Netflix. Oh, shit. Really? This is the actual story. Oh, fuck me <laughs> up. <laughs> yeah, which is why... Uh, so uh, this is like a, apparently a huge like legend in uh, Spain, in Madrid in particular. Uh huh. 
it's the only, I think, the only Spanish exorcism or haunting, rather. Um, it's not an exorcism. It's a haunting to have been documented by via police report. What what about the one in um in the UK? Because that one was. It's the only Spanish. Oh shit! Sorry. Haunting. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're back in this teenage girl's uh, bathroom, ho- holding around like the little homemade Ouija board, trying to make contact with this dead boyfriend who i'm sure was just dreamy that's fucking sick that's sick in both the ways that you would think of sick because it's like fucking sick like you know that's metal and then it's fucking sick because girls bathrooms are so fucking gross man like i was when i got to work today there was pee on the floor i was like how the fuck And, and like the seat was up like, how the hell are you going to miss that big-ass bowl and just pee all over the floor? Well, maybe she was standing. It was disgusting. Okay. Go on. <laughs> so, we're in this girl's bathroom, right? And we're sitting around <laughs> doing a Ouija board. <laughs> Three girls trying to get in touch with their one dead motorcycle boyfriend. Yeah. When all of a sudden, I've lost my place. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, okay, so I don't know if they actually made contact with anyone, uh-huh. but most reports say a teacher bursts in, a teacher or a nun, which again, if it's a Catholic school, could have been both, Yeah, catches them, and some reports say that the glass flew across the board of its own accord and shattered on the ground. Another says that when the teacher caught them, you know, they panicked and dropped the glass, they all say that regardless of how the glass broke, uh, smoke emanated from the shards of the glass and drifted into Estefania's face and she breathed in this mysterious gas Yeah, in the bathroom. Shocker. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, they all say the same thing. The teacher destroys the board in every account. Um, one account also states that the teacher left her job the very next day after what she had seen. I don't put much credence in it. <laughs> yeah, she could but, have just been sick of her job. Yeah. Regardless, from this moment on, Estefania's life took a turn for the worse. She began to suffer hallucinations, insomnia and seizures where her body would become extremely rigid. Her eyes would turn white. And she would start to foam at the mouth. She would have random outbursts of rage. She would bark, growl and hiss at her family members. She told her parents that she was seeing shadows walking through her room at night. Strange human forms with no faces, wearing cloaks, asking her to come with them. Apparently she would make strange guttural noises and babble in languages unknown to her. This behaviour, these attacks, continued and escalated for a few months. All the while, her family took it to doctors who said that her symptoms sounded like epilepsy, but none of their tests could prove uh, any definitive diagnosis. So it is said that they went to multiple do- um, doctors and like, you know, the best doctor in all of the land and all this kind of business. Nobody could prove anything. There were claims that her sister and the rest of her family had seen her levitating at different times. She would go into trance-like states where she wouldn't react to anything and would stare into space for up to 20 minutes at a time, just laughing occasionally. So completely still, completely basically dead, vacant, and every now and then would just have a little giggle. Spooky shit. She said when she was in those states, she would be in a long corridor with a thick fog covering the ground. And here she would hear sinister voices saying, come, come with us. Once, Estefania went to the bathroom to iron some clothes and her mother heard her scream. She said she had seen a silhouette and the iron turned on by itself. The mother went in to check and it was on, but it wasn't hot. When the mother was in there, 
bathroom door slammed shut on its own, locking the two of them in there. The father tried to get it open, but it wouldn't budge. And he was like banging it down, throwing shoulders and all. Just as he was about to throw a big fuck off kick at it, the door just opened smoothly on its own and let them out. So whatever this thing was, it was just up to pure fuckery, you know? So apparently she made a strange request. She asked her mother that her father's family must not be informed of her imminent death and that she would and that she had to install in her coffin a photograph in which Estefania would appear with her father. So this was like just some random like you know just shooting the shit one day she was like, "Oh, don't tell dad's side of the family I, I'm about to die and when I do will you put this picture of the two of us in my coffin that's kind of sad yeah but I mean as grim as it is it's, it's all kind of just building up and building up yeah so these attacks or whatever you want to call them came to a head on July 12th 1991 when Estefania violently lunged at her sister who managed to dodge her attack. Estefania, however, ended up on the floor, foaming at the mouth until she passed out. When she awoke, she claimed to have no memory of the attack, which was pretty normal after these uh, episodes. The very next day, Estefania is taken to the Gregorio Marignan Hospital in Madrid after suffering a serious cataleptic attack from which she never awakes. So the next piece is from uh, Perrier, Perrier, PerrierGaia.org. And this is just a big chunk of um, his article. Tell me about this article. Racist. <laughs> it seems that the rest of her day was normal. Although according to her brother Ricardo, in an interview for the radio program Dimension Limite, yeah, that's good. 2012. So, again, this is an interview with her actual brother only eight years ago. Also, this is translated from Spanish into English, mm -hmm. I think, maybe a couple of times. So, some words might seem a little odd. The morning before her death, Estefania made a sinister omen because she told her parents that she was destined to die before them. Even so, that afternoon, she met her boyfriend Pablo to go for a stroll. She returned home early, had dinner, and went to bed early. It was the calm that would precede the tragedy. On the night of July 13th, Estefania suffered an even worse attack than that of the previous night. On this occasion, she was unconscious in her bed. As Concepcion remembers, Concepcion is the mother. As Concepcion remembers, Estefania spent an insufferable half hour holding her head with her hands and expelling foam through her mouth. She was hospitalized in Gregorio Marignan Hospital, already in a coma, at 11 o'clock. Three hours later, at 2 a.m. on July 14th, the tragedy was consummated and Estefania died from pulmonary asphyxia caused by a convulsion. A very strange diagnosis for a person of her age, constitution, and health. And I did look up pulmonary asphyxia. Um, I think it was actually pulmonary asphasia. I th it, that's like a weird translation. But basically, it's choking to death on your own body fluids. Yeah. The forensic specialists were clear. In the document signed by Pedro Cabeza and Gregorio Arroyo Arieta, it could be read that Estefania had died, quote, suddenly and suspiciously. So that's supposed to be from her actual death cert. This is just one account, but the fact that he mentions the brother's interview is why I started to lean a little heavier on this one in particular. The Secretos de Ultra Tumbas details were not so convincing, stating that she died at 2.30 in 1992. <laughs> All right. so that's just to give you the range of yeah people covering this and where i was trying to get what seemed like credible facts from 
Now, there were two other girls that took part in their little Ouija board session. So why was Estefania the only one who suffered? Because she smelled the gas. And you know what they say. If you smelt it, you dealt it. Well, actually, her dying grandfather put a curse on her. No shit. Yeah. As he lay dying in hospital, Estefania's mother, Concepcion, got her children together and brought them in to see him one last time. This was not done out of love, but out of duty. The old man despised his family, and I can only assume they weren't overly fond of him. So apparently they had had a falling out over money. Um, that was, again, just one thing. I don't know what the whole argument was about. He didn't like the family, and like that, I'm assuming they weren't too fond of him. Supposedly, he pulled Estefania close so he could whisper his dying words. Oh, God, I can't. Si no puedo haceros daño en esta vida, os la haré en la siguiente. Basically, it means if I can't cause harm in this life, I will cause you harm in the next. Did I say that all right? Or do you want to yeah. just read that? No, no, you're fine. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, because I feel like I've just summoned something here. <laughs> no. So... So then that makes sense, her request to to not tell her dad's family what was going on because that's the, the, the mother's the mom's, family. That, yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Actually, could, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Maybe she just wasn't very close to the mom after that either. Yeah, I don't fucking know. So, yeah, that makes sense now. Well, according to Ricardo, the brother, Estefania assured her family that she would warn them from the other side by knocking on the walls before anything weird started to happen. Again, I only read that in one place. And this is where reports kind of really go haywire. Like the basics, that story that I just told you, Mm -hmm. is more or less the same on all... Consistent. Yeah, it's pretty consistent throughout anything that I read. Now you're going to cover the outliers. Now shit gets hectic. The uh, one article said it started <laughs> off slow. Sorry, my brain just digested that. <laughs> so yeah, something. Some articles and uh, websites said that, like the second she died, stuff in the apartment where they all lived started to go ballistic. But other sources said that's not quite what happened. It did start off slow typical poltergeist activity uh strange knocking noises from estefania's empty room her sister did live in or did they shared a room while estefania was alive but after the death it seems that they just left the room so i'm assuming that the sister moved into another room i would because this shit gets creepy okay we'll come out with it so strange knocking noises from estefania's empty bedroom They would go and check the room, which they always kept tidy. And Estefania's stuff would be just all over the place. Reports of, like, bed sheets being fucked over to, like, the other side of the the room. Um, Like, not just, like, little things pulled out here or there. Like, a total fucking mess. Doors started to open and close on their own. Uh, Her bed would be unmade every morning. And glasses would just, like spontaneously like explode basically in the house they would hear disembodied voices whispering mama mama coming from estefania's bedroom bed bathroom coming from estef coming from estefania's bathroom and when they would check there would be no one there they began to hear scraping along the walls and an old man cackling would seem to come from from the walls or ceiling itself. The laughter soon turned to a loud wailing and hard banging sounds like someone was punching through the walls. According to one source, Concepcion said the phenomena would manifest at 11.30 every night, the same time that Estefania went into her coma. Lights and appliances started to turn on and off by themselves, The doors began to open and close so much that they would have to put their heavy furniture in front of them to stop it. 
but they would still see the handles going ballistic, rattling, and eventually whatever it was was strong enough to force the furniture out of the way and they would have like couches blasting across the room and the, and every time this would happen it would just sound like a huge wind was blowing at the other side of the door in one instance a door was flung open causing a photo of estefania to fall to the ground when her mother went to pick it up she dropped it suddenly her father reached for it and saw a flame start to burn through estefania's face but the frame was never touched like the glass wasn't damaged the frame wasn't damaged just the photo soon after this happened the family started to see a strange dark humanoid figure moving quietly about the house this is a quote from one of estefania's sisters i have in brackets apparently <laughs> we heard a whistling sound like on other nights and then a groan near the door we were so scared we were frozen it was then we noticed something on the floor as the light from the street lights would enter our bat would enter our bedroom and light it up it was the shape of a man crawling dragging itself along the floor he had a black head no eyes no mouth nothing it was crawling towards us and we started to scream it was then that the toys we had on a shelf started to be thrown violently towards the other wall, one by one. And then we heard bangs and shouts. Can you imagine? Yeah. Sitting in your bedroom and here's this thing crawling along the floor and then shit just starts getting, no. Yeah, I can see it in my head. It's terrifying. This sounds a, like, it, this sounds less like um what like in i guess a uh, ouija board induced and more like grandfather cursed the family type of thing because it was almost like he's it like her things are specifically being because if it was just if it was ouija board induced it'd be gone i feel like you know, because it was with her, like it was with her. It was a possession. It's like, okay, I'm going to take your soul. All right. I got your soul. Now I'm going to dip. But <laughs> all right, I'm a bounce. Yeah. Like, um, what, like that SpongeBob meme. All right, I'm out. Yeah. But because shit's still going on and specifically her stuff is getting fucked up, like her picture is getting burnt. It's almost like. Yeah, I'm going to fuck with y'all, but I'm going to still make y'all think that it's her, her having to do with her. It's sort of like, what is it called? A red herring? Oh, like you think it's trying to come across as it is her? Yeah. Causing? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it because he specifically told her. So Yeah, for whatever reason. I don't he know what could have just to told uh, if he... He hated the family. He could have easily picked the brother, grabbed him, gave him the same fucking curse. Same shit would have happened to this Ricardo dude. And then, you know, you, you yeah, get what I'm saying? Or was it like, yeah, fair enough. Maybe she was just the one closest to him at that yeah. minute. But I think that's what it had then to do she with. she also like was fucking around with the Ouija board. So maybe that's what like kind of sealed the deal. Possibly. But yeah, it, it, but I agree with you on that part where it was like she it, it probably just fell to her simply because she was standing in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. At her grandfather's dying bed. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But he did want to fuck with this family for real. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like that's fucking terrifying. Anyway. Visiting neighbors confirmed the family's claims, reporting shadows skittering along the walls of the home and seeing toys and other objects being thrown across the room sometimes being thrown so hard that they were actually embedded in the wall. There are reports of glasses being thrown at the kids and even the family poodle getting fucked across the room. That's so mean. <laughs> uh, unseen forces shoving the kids. There was one thing saying like the dad and the youngest kid were like messing around, like dancing or doing some shit. And all of a sudden the kid just got lifted up into the air and the dad was like, didn't know what to do, you know. He just got yeeted across the womb. Yeah, across the womb. Yeah, the room. <laughs> <laughs> Yeet. <laughs> Apparently, the family were so scared 
that they dragged all of their mattresses into the living room to sleep together which to me sounds kind of logical i would probably do something similar but like if we're all together yeah you like know, the conjuring yeah that's what they did and then also uh in that movie uh the haunting in uh connecticut no it was in the uk oh the enfield haunting that yeah said and- the conjuring too yeah yeah that one okay yeah um according to her sister in a 2006 interview knives flew and she was a girl of about six years old oh sorry no knives is a girl what no, knives are a thing that you cut meat with hey on scott pilgrim there was a girl named knives her name was knives knives chow i think her name was and she was really cool i don't know what scott pilgrim is According to her sister, in a 2006 interview, Knives flew and she saw a girl of about six years old who never said anything but was always there. Always there. Who said this? Estefania's sister, one of them. Okay. Yeah, she was saying that Knives would just like be thrown across the room. And she would see a random little girl? Yeah, but like the way they quoted her here, it sounded like this little girl was constantly there just watching. But I don't know whether only she could see this. You know? Yeah. This went on for months. And the family were desperate for help. And apparently all sorts of charlatans and just arseholes reached out saying shit like, I'll sort out your gaff or I'll sort out your house if you just give me 200,000 pesetas. Mm. Which is about $1,500 now. And just feeding them a load of bollocks. I did see, like, one thing that was, like, on the fucking news. And it was this medium psychic dude, like, screaming at the mom. I think it was the mom. And she was supposed to be possessed by the thing that was haunting the house. And there was just, she was just in the bath being screamed at and growling back at the dude. Like, it's interesting to watch. But I'm fairly sure that this guy has been proven to be a fucking, a charlatan. Yeah. A big fat phony. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I hope you keep that in. (laughs) So the general consensus among all of the mediums here was that the grandfather was actually the one haunting the family. Called it. But Estefania was still there trying to protect them all Mm. from him and any other evil entities. Mm -hmm. So it was like this epic afterlife battle. Yeah. Um, And now there was other... I didn't want to go too into... Because I would find one story from one article that just went off on its own little tangent. They, I think that um, the main kind of medium guy who just wanted all their money came up with like a name for this demon and was like, you know, it's him and he's doing all this, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But again, general consensus was grandfather and Estefania and whoever the grandfather had like fucking employed, basically. Yeah. Okay. So it did get a lot of media attention. But still, nobody could actually help them. All these people, all these medium psychics, whatever. Mm-hmm. Nobody could actually get rid of it. Okay. The parents would see this shadow crawling in the hallway. And one night, they were all gathered in the hallway. And a ball rolled down. Like. Yeah, I get it. Pure horror movie th- stuff. Mm-hmm. So, it frightened Maximo, the dad. Mm-hmm. And he just picked it up and threw it back down the hall. Only for it to turn around midair and come flying back at them. (laughs) Like, fuck that. Leave. Concepcion would spread flour on the floor. Only to find men's shoe prints in the flour the next day. Mm -hmm. Um, 2 a.m. on November 27th, 1922. 1992. Fucking hell. 2 a.m. on November 27th, 1992. Concepcion woke up in the middle of the night feeling pressure on top of her. Quote, I felt a pair of hands grab my feet and then my arm. And 
this was one of many occurrences like this happened quite a lot but this particular night she was like at her wits end and not knowing what else to do she called the police or rather her husband called the police so maximo gutierrez actually made the call saying his house is haunted and his whole family are in danger and the police didn't believe him at first so he passed the phone around to each family member and they all just started telling him what the fuck was going on being like no no no, like this shadow person and knives are thrown and something caught fire blah 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 so eventually officer jose negri and three other police officers went to the house and i think they were like genuinely concerned for their mental health that's the only reason why this jose fella even you know rounded up the troops to go when they got to the house they found the family sitting on the curb outside this is middle of the night in late november it's fucking cold they're all terrified but the officers convinced them to come back up to the apartment and show them you know just watch what they all sit around the kitchen table and start to explain the situation the following is a translation of part of the official police report we were found amidst a rare and mysterious situation that being seated in the company of all the family we could hear and observe a perfectly closed cabinet door something which we verified afterwards open suddenly in a completely unnatural way this started a series of suspicious events that were witnessed by the chief inspector and the three other police officers present whilst still in a state of shock a powerful noise came from the terrace where we could prove that there was no one present the suspicious events then increased in quantity and severity taking the investigation up to an unexpected level moments later they could hear and see that on a tablecloth on a small telephone table there appeared a brown stain which the chief inspector identified as drool during the search of the rooms of the home they observed a wooden crucifix to which the phenomenon to which we are referring had turned it over tearing the christ that was attached to it that according to one of the sons he took the christ from the floor and adhered it behind the door of the room next to a poster also producing suddenly and strangely three scratches on the aforementioned poster falling back to the floor christ who in the first instance as i say above was glued to the wooden cross so again that's a translation so it is kind of hard to mm-hmm. to grasp but that was like i think the little mini jesus getting ripped off the cross was like what topped it off for the police and they were like right, we're fucking out of here mm-hmm. like good luck you're on your own but yeah i thought that was a pretty interesting thing like on its own just the fact that this i've never heard of a crucifix being torn apart mm-hmm. you know um and apparently it was inverted and that was another common exp- common uh thing in the house where they would they would find the crucifixes inverted and stuff so the police had no answers and could help no more than anyone else according to one source the family stayed in the house and eventually the activity died down to the point where they could even use estefania's bathroom again Hmm. other sources say that they eventually left and once they left the activity stopped in 2006 the popular spanish paranormal television show cuarto milenio investigated the Gutierrez's the Gutierrez's former residence in Vallecas, Madrid. After filming the episode during editing, the team claimed to have discovered a mysterious voice in one of the interviews with Estefania's parents at their new home. So they were being asked about mm. you know has anything weird happened since you know you've moved or mm-hmm. anything like this? And it just said no hemos Comenzado. We haven't begun. Yeah. Fucking hell. Which is just like the most bone chilling oh. statement. No hemos comenzado. But there has been no other reports from the family since then. Um in that interview and stuff that I was watching with them, the the one sister did say and I felt really bad for her. Like she had a lot of friends in school and then once her sister was um, like she was possessed or whatever. Once all that started happening, 
the kids just started bullying her and then so like not only did her like or i don't know whether she was younger or older but not only did the sister die she lost all her friends and she was then like i think the family were kind of like blacklisted as yeah. being like oh they're the crazies like they live in the haunted house or yeah but the other thing that i found interesting was this is an apartment building like and it's just this one apartment within this building that is so badly haunted yeah like it does say that neighbors and stuff were able to confirm you know all the different goings on and seeing weird shit but there's no other reports from like neighbors you know well i mean that's like saying it's illogical that neighbors would be able to wouldn't be able to hear but there's nothing rational or logical about these kinds of activities yeah, you know yeah what I'm i saying? suppose yeah but anyway that's my story that's a good story and you know what um and in saying that maybe that was just one of those things that um this demon was able to do in order to further isolate them because if they were if it allowed for other people to hear it then other people would be like no no they're not crazy like i hear it too but if they're the only ones, cr- you know, saying these things, then it just makes them sound even crazier because it's, the neighbors could be like, well, I don't know what the fuck they're talking about. I don't, I yeah, don't hear I shit. I just hear them screaming at night. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean. I mean, that's what that's what demonic. That's what demons are said to do whenever they're, I guess, trying to overtake a person is they try they feed into the loneliness and the isolation yeah and and your Mm -hmm. fears or whatever all right so right after we recorded this episode adam yelled at me (laughs) and this is me apologizing (laughs) uh no i actually got an email from miguel angel linares de nordillo dope Uh, so this guy actually lives very close to vallecas less than 10 minutes walk apparently and i found him through the comments on one of those like crazy websites that i was on you know trying to find the best story and so he actually sent me a chapter of his book on this email it was a pretty long email but i had reached out to him because in the comments he said you know like i live by here this isn't what happened basically what he said was more or less what i had covered on the thing like very little um differences but he also included an interview with one of the police officers who was supposedly on the scene that night when Jose Negri wrote his police report. And this guy basically said that this wasn't the first time police were called out to the house. That police had actually been called out to the house on a previous night before Estefania even died. And the reason why they were called this night was because Estefania and her boyfriend, and I don't know who else, were playing Ouija board again. So apparently this was a very common thing for them. And this night, whatever it was on the Ouija board actually caused her boyfriend, which he did name here, but I'm not going to name, to have a seizure and start foaming at the mouth. And police arrived and I don't know how accurate this is, but they had to put him in handcuffs. Like he started freaking the fuck out, showing extreme strength. And the police officer who was dealing with him was a woman and she said she actually threatened to... It got to the stage where he was trying to break the handcuffs from behind his back. And she thought that he was going to. Like, that's how much she was freaking out. And she said, uh, you know, if you break those handcuffs, I'm going to have to draw my weapon. So that's where it goes. Um, that's, that's all it said on that. But there was a history of Estefania playing with the Ouija board. And in that house, like it was actually in her bedroom this night. It also says that from the police officer... That was there that night the second time the police were called the one the famous um, report with jose negri that this guy basically didn't wit- witness any of it he just seems to be a complete skeptic he's like ah oh, you know it's been blown out of proportion i don't know whether this is just to kind of throw people off the case or, or whatever like just stop harassing him or whatever uh, he went on as unnamed but he said all this stuff that was happening didn't happen in front of him yeah he did see the door being opened on the the closet door or the the cabinet door whatever and yeah he did hear the big bang on the balcony or the terrace like the rest of them did and he said he didn't see the brown stain 
I showed up basically and he just that was it he was like you know what no <laughs> mm-hmm. um there was also apparently reports that some agents or some police officers drew their weapons because they were so afraid and he said that's totally false so it actually seems like he was just trying to cover um the police officers end of things to clear it up saying you know they acted totally professional and you know they're not crazy or anything like that so to me him denying the stuff in this little interview this radio interview kind of reinforces it to me <laughs> you well, know yeah especially when you when you look at and maybe this speaks to the kind of um the perspectives um and the feel for the 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 small community that they are in right now yeah because when when they were exhibiting like the family was vocal about their experiences the repercussions that it reaped you know yeah so of it, it makes sense if this guy is adamantly denying any sort of thing that could be misconstrued as paranormal um it is you're right it speaks volumes yeah and now another thing that miguel goes on to say is that apparently about two years ago two of the brothers because i think i said that she had six siblings what i meant was six including herself so sorry Mm -hmm. if that caused any confusion um but anyway two of her brothers uh came out and did say that they caused some of the phenomena themselves what does that mean it could be anything like you know the knocking or whatever but that kind of goes back to the enfield haunting as well you know a few years later like these girls still talk publicly about this and in terms of the the from the child's perspective you know they have all these adults coming over and expecting things to happen and they're not saying that this stuff doesn't happen if but by trying to prove that it does happen they go out of their way to like you know oh no no see this this just happened right now and Mm -hmm. so that's like on a lot of larger hauntings that seems to be the downfall of them you know because they'll be so desperate to make this thing happen like that they'll go out of their way to to fake it Mm -hmm. to be like oh no look i swear it is going on when really it could fucking be going on but yeah the one time yeah i get it i get what i get that because it's like if it doesn't happen that people will add will can well they'll they'll call you liars you know exactly they'll call you liars and then when they catch you you're still a liar you know so it's the same thing that happened with um what was the dude's name from the boiley rectory harry price or something super famous anyway it was literally his downfall um you know he had documented all this like almost solid evidence and just again trying to do it on command never seems to work Mm -hmm. um and that was like the end of them basically yeah um but yeah so i just wanted to say thanks to uh miguel for Mm -hmm. writing back as well yeah he's still very involved in the paranormal community in spain that's awesome yeah so I like um, that. yeah i highly doubt that he's ever going to listen to this because we both spoke to each other through google translate <laughs> <laughs> i mean you never know yeah hopefully um that's really cool though yeah like it, it just sucks especially if there's children involved with paranormal stuff exactly because uh, like the like when you gaslight someone and when you purposely get ga- like the 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 negative effects of gaslighting is like it, they make People are intentionally trying to make you feel crazy or invalidate your yeah. feelings. And I feel like that kind of trauma, that damage is very similar to what children would or people would experience when they say, no, there's something going on here. And then you have and then the, the ghost itself or the possession itself is trying to make you feel crazy. Yeah. And especially can you imagine like, no, like my dad's telling the truth. Or, yeah. Or yeah. My mom, like they, we saw this shit happen yeah so anyway again i'm not going to be on either side unless i'm actually present during a fucking case mm-hmm. i'm not going to say one way or another yeah there's valid arguments from both sides yeah and there is we just like getting as much information out there mm-hmm. so yeah okay y'all so um like i was just telling adam during our bathroom break um that um you should probably uh amp up your or whatever methods that you use 
for protection, whether it be burning your white sage, your cedar, um, amping up your prayers, uh, your crystals, your crystal grids, your Saint, your Saint Michael's uh, candles, or you know, pray to Santa Muerte, or whoever it is that you want to talk to to amp up your protection in these times. Because in October, not only is a veil thinning between the living and the dead, but um, spirits are more active. Um, you can easily pick up on things if you're of that inclination. Um, and if you're not, it's even, you know, it, it enables you to, to do pick up on those things. Um, allow things to attach to you. Um mischievous things or just weird happenings around you caused by the fae or any sort of spirit nature spirit uh elemental whatever you're just more open you're vulnerable therefore you have to protect yourself during this month of october so yeah thank you and with that we'll move on to uh my segment Yay. so so this was suggested to me by one of our fans, uh, Miss Amy Plunkett. Yay, Amy. She suggested that I pick up a little book called The Book of Execution. So I was like, all right, um, I'll do that. So I ordered it. It's by Jeffrey Abbott. And this was a lot and when i mean by a lot it was it was a lot of very good information to get through it's just so much so many kinds of executions and i don't want to leave out any of them normally uh we have some episodes that are pre-recorded so we don't get caught with our pants down but this basically took up my attention for about three weeks and I feel like and I'm still not done typing up the notes like this was huge this was a lot so what I'm going to end up doing is I'm going to do it piecemeal I I don't want I, I want it to be all together right so like for the next this episode and the next two episodes I'm going to um just talk about methods of execution <laughs> right on and if you don't like it, tough. <laughs> okay. So the first method that I want to discuss is axe. Okay. It <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it's a method of execution that was, was, was reserved to nobility and was considered more honorable. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Weird, right? The heading axe, as it was called, was 36 inches long and weighed over a little over seven pounds. The blade itself was rough and about 16 inches long. So think about 16 inches. Yeah. And so it was about, uh, and again, it, it was rough. So it wasn't like a, it wouldn't deliver you a clean cut. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, right. The Tower of London is supposed to have an actual axe. An actual axe. An for actual beheading. heading axe. Yeah. Cool. It's not a replica. It's the actual. It's, it's an actual one. axe. Well, not the one, but a axe. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's seen a lot of necks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, pork chop. <laughs> She's so quiet. <laughs> Just going to go have a sit. It's like I'm just sitting here listening to this podcast. <laughs> Almost as important as the axe was the block that had to be changed out after every execution. As it would split during execution. Was it just a wooden block? It went from just being a block of timber and then eventually they, they would like sculpt the block to include, to include ridges and hollows to allow for the placement of like your shoulders you know so that's like it's thoughtful yeah i know right that's what i was thinking it's like oh that's so nice it's like comfortable right to let the blood flow as well probably uh 
well, so like on one side of the block, they had ridges for your shoulders. So it was like a wide hollow for your shoulders. And on the opposite end of the block, uh, where your neck would go was a smaller ridge forward, but that allowed for the neck to extend. Oh, okay. So, um, be, and then it would, um, create a larger target for the executioner. Because when you're wielding an axe, it's not exactly a tool for precision. Yeah. You know, you're just kind of gauging where it's going to fall. So that kind of just helped the execution go smoother. But it, it would guide it to an extent. Right. But the problem was that it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Rarely did an executioner ever have to swing once and then the deed was done. More than... Oh. It was more common that more than it had. It took more than one swing. Another common thing to see is uh, condemned men and women pay their executioner a few coins to encourage them to kill them quickly and hopefully with just one swing. Nice. Yeah. Have to tip your executioner. <laughs> yeah, you base it, They base it, That's what they did. That's just what. As you do. Do you think they were like, <laughs> "Fuck, I only have a tenner. Like, is this gonna be enough?" Imagine being like a counterfeiter, though. Be like, I can give this man so many coins, though. <laughs> and he'd have no idea. <laughs> All right. So, I have a weird axe story. Hit me with it. Uh, uh. <laughs> I'll hit you with it several times. Hey. hey. <laughs> okay. And I'm going to um, read it out of the book. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> incredible defiance rather than grace and propriety was shown when margaret pole countess of salisbury mounted the scaffold this elderly lady whose family had fallen foul of henry five six seven eight, uh, eight. <laughs> <laughs> henry the eighth was the of henry the eighth he, he was he a was tutor the, he was the one that would like just behead his wives. Yeah, he's the one that had like a butt little wife. Yeah yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. This elderly lady whose family had fallen foul of Henry VIII had been imprisoned for two years without trial, warmth, or adequate clo clothing. Now her final moments had come, but when she was told to lay her head on the block, she refused. Oh. Saying, So should traitors do, and I am none. When the executioner insisted, imagine that, be like, please, ma'am, could you just put your head on this block? I'd be like, what the <laughs> fuck does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> she, quote, turned her gray head this way and that and bid him if he would have her head to get it off as best he could so that he was constrained to fetch it off slovenly, end quote. Uh. Is that like in The Simpsons when Homer is like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk towards you like this, hum hum," and if you get eaten, it's your own fault. <laughs> is it kind of similar to that? Like or I'm gonna move like, my head like this, and if you swing yeah, your oh, axe, yeah, 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 or like kind of like how Bart was like told Lisa, "I'm gonna swing my arms like this, and if yeah, you're yeah, my, yeah. if I, you get hit, that's your fault." Um, no, I actually think he meant <laughs> if you want my head, come get it. Come at me, bro. Yeah. <laughs> and so he is said to have pursued her round the block, striking her head and shoulders with the axe until she finally succumbed to the onslaught, her mutilated corpse being buried in the chapel of St. Peter. Wow. So she was basically hacked with an axe on the scaffold. Where she stood like. No, she was running around. And he, the executioner was just running behind her, <laughs> swinging the axe at her while she was like, basically like parts of her was, were her. She was getting mutilated yeah, alive. Yeah, butchered on the on Exactly. The thing. Wow. So that's my weird axe story. I mean, she could have just gone peacefully. Like, All right, everybody. I uh, hope you liked it. See you next week. <laughs> yeah. The next method of execution is the bastinado bastinado i don't know caning a man gently and rhythmically with a light 
weight stick, a little slap and tickle, if you will. Yeah. A skilled executioner was needed to sustain the torture for hours before the mental collapse and eventual death of the victim. The Chinese has perfected this using thin split bamboo. Isn't that weird how I said that? The Chinese, <laughs> the Chinese people, uh, they had to train on bean curds. Like, you know, like rolls of bean curd. Oh, what? Like, I'm oh, sorry, you're not good enough to torture a real person. Well, no, they had to practice first. Jesus Christ. They had to practice doing it on bean curds because this kind of method you're not supposed to break the skin yeah so it's that's just... why they had to practice on the bean curd because it's like okay you're gonna slap around this bean curd <laughs> until you until i don't see any fucking cuts i just want to hear i just i just want to hear this that's it why do they have to get so fucking intricate like <laughs> <laughs> Be, I, that's one of the things that well one of the things that struck me as fast and struck me like a like fucking amazing while i was reading this was um the complexity of uh execution you know yeah and also the fascination that people had with viewing these kinds of executions because there was o um, always a crowd there was always oh, a crowd yeah. uh, they heard Oh, uh, fucking John Doe is going to get axed um, Thursday, 12 o'clock noon. All right, buddy, I'll see you there. It, it Because it was, everything was boring. Everybody was depressed. Everybody had yeah. problems. You didn't fucking shower every day. What the fuck were you going to do? <laughs> you were going to go see someone get axed. Yeah, absolutely. You know? You were bringing the popcorn. I'd bring the drinks. and then. Yeah, you know, there was... Um, <clears throat> vendors. Yeah, there were... Uh, t uh, and, and during some executioners there was like like a concession there were like concession yeah. stands yeah but anyways so right where were we <laughs> they, <laughs> they had to practice doing it on bean curds because they weren't supposed to break the skin uh apparently like hours of this is supposed to make you pass out um after out of out after hours of um, sustaining this kind of torture, uh, they would pour boiling water over your lacerations. Um, and I'm not, it, it didn't, it didn't break down exactly what this did to the body, but I think it might have put you in some sort of shock or something. But this was, this actually resulted in a very slow and painful death. That, that to me is just insane. So, like, the, your, your feet, would event like the skin would break eventually just because of the constant like tapping with this fucking bamboo yeah but the thing is like it it some people just did it on your feet but like uh i think in china they did this like all around your body oh fuck yeah wow yeah weird right yeah kind of weird <laughs> so who do you think came up with that it's like hey dale's got this great new idea <laughs> <laughs> i think dale's a fucking weirdo all right so the next one is beaten to death okay as opposed to like a light slap and tickle all right so beaten to death usually with whips or clubs the most vicious form of whipping came from russia they use something called a newt which is probably just another way of saying not in English. But um, and just like everything, but just uh, so you know, and I'll probably have to say this in the next few episodes when I keep discussing on discussing the many ways of how to kill someone else. <laughs> um, there will be variations of methods and tools in different parts of the world. So if I don't, if I explain something and you're like oh well i heard it something somewhere different and it's like it, you're probably right too but we're both probably right <laughs> yeah yeah there's lots of different yeah um words. okay <laughs> all right so um anyways there were basically long leather whips 
uh they were they all looked different but they were essentially the same they were leather long whip long whips and had like metal loops on some had metal loops on them some had metal claws uh attached to them uh intertwined with the leather um or like wire that made them n- not like limp or flaccid but sort of like hold their shape Correct. Right, so it was just a combination of leather and metal, these whips, right? Um, so the, these metal pieces were, de- were designed to do more damage as they struck the skin of the condemned. Executioners had to change out their whips frequently because, fun fact, blood softens the leather and won't do as much damage as it had initially. And you can't be having that. You need your leather up to scratch, like. Right. In St. Petersburg, skilled executioners could tell you on the spot, like if you were to straight up ask them, uh, they could tell you how many strokes it would take to kill a man depending on their size. Jesus. Yeah. So they would just size you up and be like, "Mm, this person would be this many lashes and to torture them. Cool. But to kill them, this is how many you need. I mean, I don't see why not. Victims were not always beaten to death. And there are written accounts of those who have gone through this kind of torture. They describe it as feeling like their skin was being torn by the talons of a falcon. A person could be sentenced to lashes well into the thousands. That That's batshit. Yeah. In, 18, in the 1800s, it was reported by a doctor examining a man who had just had only 200 lashes that once his lashes, once his wounds were cleaned, the man's backbone and shoulder blade were actually laid bare. So you could see like the bones. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. One eyewitness account that dated back, that dates back to 1812 describes the execution of a man that had been sentenced to get beaten to death. He said that blood starts to run down their shoes and their backs begin to look like raw, red, chopped sausage meat. Ah. Uh, that, that is fucking horrific, though. Yeah. Especially because we just had sausage. Like, uh, and so in my head, I'm like, that's what their backs look like. Yeah. Yeah. This is grim. <laughs> <laughs> I regret everything. <laughs> All right. Uh, here we go. Boiled alive. Yeah. Oh, okay. This method was utilized in Europe and to the Far East in the 13th to 16th century. It was a penalty for counterfeiters. The law read... Should a coiner be caught in the act, then let him be stewed in a pan or in a cauldron half an L deep for the body. An L is a measurement, is a form of measurement, Hmm. uh, uh, which basically means like half an arm. (laughs) Uh. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Anyways, so that the man may be bound to a pole, which shall be passed through the rings of the cauldron and which shall be tightly strapped and bound to upright posts on either side, and thus he shall be made to stew in oil and wine. Like, do do oil and wine burn hotter than water? It was just a liquid. Why not just use water? Uh, Well, they could could use water. Water was used sometimes. Yeah. Um, Like any execution, as mentioned before, it drew a large crowd of spectators, Some countries used oil, some countries used tar, molten lead, or wax instead of water or wine. Sometimes the victims would be dipped head first. Oh, fucking hell. Others doubled up with their knees tied to their chest, like a little meatball. Yeah. (laughs) But I wonder, like, at what point does hot just become... Sun? Yeah, you know what I mean? (laughs) Like, is there a certain level where you're just like... This yeah. could be 100 degrees. This could be 800 degrees. Yeah. It's just burning all my fucking skin off anyway. Yeah. 
And do you think they drowned before they died? If they were head well, first? No, I, they'd, the pain would probably trigger their shock. Yeah, yeah. And I think they'd probably end up drown. I think they'd end up drowning. They'd Fucking go unconscious hell. first, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, not before experiencing severe pain. Oh, yeah. This is this is one of the more intricate ones. The Raisin Bull. The Raisin Bull. Red Bull. Only this one has no wings. <laughs> <laughs> You fucking Zach Bagans over there. <laughs> Only <laughs> this one has no wings. Situation. Situation. Mercury. <laughs> Mercury. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Where, 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 oh, yeah. Brazen. Brazen? Brazen. Brazen. Brazen bull. Invented in Sicily by, Athenian, by an Athenian named Perilous. The device was a hollow bull made of brass. The bull what was, the bull was large enough to hold a person in it that would enter it using the trap door on the bull's back. A fire would then be built under the bull so as to heat up heat up the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Perilous also hollowed out holes in the bull's nose so you can hear the screams of the victim inside. The screams were supposed to mimic the lowing of a bull. I guess the lowing is what the, the mooing. Bull. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The man mooing because, you know, it's a bull. Yeah. Perilous presented this invention to the to Phalaris, the tyrant of Agrigentum, which I guess he was um, the ruler at that time in uh, in Sicily. Valeris was famous for being a mean son of a bitch. <laughs> I wrote that myself. Um, Abbott didn't write that. So the story goes as follows. Anticipating rich rewards for his ingenuity, he demonstrated his brainchild to Phalaris, the tyrant of Agrigentum. But even he, infamous as he was for the harsh treatment of his subject, recoiled at the diabolical machine, saying, according to the historian Lucian, Well now, Perilous, if you are so sure of your contrivance, give us a proof of it on the spot. Mount up and imitate the cries of a man tortured in it, that we may hear whether such charming music will proceed from it as you will make us believe. Perilous obeyed, and no sooner was he inside the bowl than I shut their aperture, and put fire beneath it. Take that, said I, as the only recompense such a piece of art is worth. Enchant us the first specimen of the charming notes of which you are the inventor. And so the bar barbarous wretch suffered what he had well merited by such a fiendish application of his mechanical talent. However, that the noble work should not be contaminated by his dying there, I ordered him to be drawn out while still alive and thrown down from the summit of the rock where his body was left unburied. Oh, and I just left his hell. body there. So that's what he got for his uh, compensation of devising this thing. Right, right, right. Poor bastard. Right. But um, a joke's on him, though, because eventually um, Phalaris, uh ended up dying in the bull himself. Once the people were like, you know what? We're tired of having to listen to you, you big fat asshole. So let's throw you in this fucking bull. And that's what happened. Kind of sounds like we need another one of these bulls. <laughs> <laughs> Ready for the next one? Fuck yeah. Okay. This one's broken by the wheel. Ooh. <laughs> so this one has a bunch of different ways. That people just died by the wheel, right? Okay. Or broken by the wheel. So this method originated in 192 AD. Victims were secured on a wide wooden bench and an iron wheel would then be laid onto his body. The executioner would then pound on the wheel with a hammer, starting with the ankles and moving upward to the legs. Romans used this on Christian martyrs. Sometimes the wheel would be laid vertically to the victim or horizontally. 
Some wheels were smaller, so once the victim was on the bench, the executioner would just lift the fucking wheel and slam it into the body of the victim. Like, why wouldn't you just use, like... A rock. Or, like, a... Yeah. Anything. <laughs> Anyways. I guess they invented the wheel before the rock. <laughs> <laughs> really, man. This new wheel thing is the bee's knees. We can use this for so much stuff. Yeah. I'm never using a rock again. Rocks are for idiots. <laughs> In some areas, victims were tied to the circumference of the wheel and then propelled over rows of spikes. Jesus. That sounds like a fucking... Oh, what's that game that I'm thinking of? I don't know, like a Tomb Raider fucking... Mm. That's not what I'm thinking of. No. Are you, t- are you talking about Temple Run? No. Oh. May I actually, may I maybe. <laughs> Another variation was being tied to the face of the wheel and then suspended on an upright. This allowed the executioner to break the hanging limbs that were hanging. The hanging limbs that were hanging. (laughs) To break the hanging limbs that were um, in between the iron. Wait, what? Okay, let me read it again. This allowed the executioner to break the hanging limbs with iron bars. And then... But, sorry, wait. What, so what's the point of the fucking wheel? Well, hang oh, on. Oh, they're like... So, like, imagine yes. a wheel, right? And it's it's not, like, the, it's not standing. It's, like, imagine uh, the top part of a carousel, you know? Yeah. So, but no horses and no fun. <laughs> and it's smaller, so you're basically lying on top of that wheel. And, oh, okay, yeah. And your I'll arms, on, yeah. yeah, and your arms would be hanging in between the what are those called? Spokes. The spokes. And then an executioner beneath you would be breaking your hanging limbs with iron bars. And once he's done, your limbs would be then intertwined with the spokes. Oh, yeah, I've heard that already. Yeah. Which would be easy to do because they're all broken now yeah. and fractured. And then you would be left to die in agony. Jesus Christ. Yeah. So, like I said before, there's other ways that people freestyled the yeah, wheel. Yeah. But these are the ones that stood out to me. So, these are the ones that I'm going to fucking talk about. Yikes. There's a lot of yikes in this. Yeah. Okay. Stay with me, though. There's only four more for this episode. Okay. Okay. Buried alive. What does that one entail? (laughs) Well, the victim, while dying, they would be buried up to their neck. Buried. They would be. (laughs) They would be buried up to their necks and only their head was visible. Death would only be apparent when the eyes were closed and they were silent, naturally. Dutch women who refused Roman Catholicism brought to them by the Spaniards would suffer this fate. Only their head would be covered, like, the way I read it, it was like, it'd be, they'd be buried, right? And just like their head would be exposed and they would, but their head would be like sprinkled with some dirt. You know, it wouldn't be like packed. Like the rest of their body was. And then. Then. (laughs) And then. The executioner would then stomp on the head of the condemned. Fucking hell. Yeah. Is there really any need for that? The complexities. Yeah. In Switzerland, they would bury people inside the walls of their. In the walls or cellars of their buildings. Of their own buildings. Yeah. Okay. Isn't that weird? It's like, you know what this place needs? A ghost. <laughs> <laughs> For the feng shui. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I know it's pronounced feng shui. In India, female offenders would be buried upright into the earth up to their armpits only. So, like, you know, that would be exposed to the environment their head would be uncovered and fully exposed to the heat of the sun with no food or water and you know how fucking hot 
it gets over there. Well, no, I don't. I've never been, but it gets pretty fucking hot here, and I can only imagine. Yeah. Um, if she survived the time she was given, she would be pardoned. But more often than not, victims would die anyway because of lack of privations. So that I'm. This is why it's under buried alive because they'd almost always die anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like okay, yeah, you're buried alive, but. You're probably going to die. Die regardless. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, buried upside down. Buried alive upside down. The victim was suspended. (laughs) Why are you laughing? (laughs) You're like waiting for me to say something about it. (laughs) The victim was suspended by his ankles from a gallows erected immediately over a hole dug in the earth. The length of the rope being such that the upper part of the body was below the level of the ground. Suitably shaped boards were then placed tightly about his body to cover the hole and pegged to the ground so that little light and air was able to penetrate. One of the victim's arms remained unpinioned and above ground so that he could signal when he was prepared to confess to the crime of which he had been accused or that he was ready to renounce his faith and accept another. So uh, what I'm describing comes from 17th century Japan. Anyways, the sufferings of the victim were indescribable. And since its introduction in 1633, many criminals, heretics, and political offenders met their death in that manner. Not surprised. (laughs) Right. Burned at the stake. The weird thing about this one is that this was reserved for women to protect their modesty. Of course. In London, women sat in a stool that was bound to a stake. There would also be a chain or a noose around the woman's neck connected to the stake as well. The executioner would pull on the noose and the idea was that the woman would die of strangulation before she was engulfed in flames. Okay, so what was the point of the flames then? Uh, be, m- for modesty because they didn't they thought it was indecent to like kill a woman in such manner and like her body be like all like her legs be all open and you know she'd be Put laid in dead in a suggestive way like this is how twisted yeah, yeah, yeah. the thinking is you know it's like oh yes look at that, her up there being a whore yeah look at that corpse being all suggestive so that's why they burned them that makes perfect sense. Yeah, I know. But anyway, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, some victims would be allowed to have small bags of gunpowder uh, that would hang from the bodies of the victims to speed up the dying process. I would definitely go for that. I would have the biggest bag of gunpowder. <laughs> okay, so while reading this chapter, I found a really gross method of torture that I want to share. Um, so, oh. Uh, Again, I'll say burned at the stake, different ways of burning at the stake. Yeah. But I thought that was interesting that this one specifically had a noose and a stool. Yeah. Accessorizing. Of course. And a little bag of gunpowder. Like, <laughs> you're going to go out? Go out with a bang. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, so yeah, this, this whole thing is about execution, but I wanted to talk about this one torture thing. Um, it's called Tormento de Toca. Which is when water would be poured through gauze that would be inside of a victim's mouth. So the idea is you would just pour, you would like um, fold up a long length of gauze and put it in someone's mouth. And while you're pouring water inside that person's mouth, it would, it would push the gauze into the the throat throat. and into the stomach right but there would still be gauze hanging out of the person's mouth or in the mouth right so what would happen is once uh the majority of the length of the gauze is already inside the person they would um pull out the gauze slowly out of the person jesus and it would be covered in blood but this was a form of torture yeah, because it like 
there's no way this was some nice soft fabric like you know like yeah some rough fucking yeah well Jesus. it had to be if it was covered in blood imagine yeah, the damage yeah. it was doing on its way back up Christ. another me- and, and you know what um who's to say that this wasn't done like over and over again on the yeah, same person yeah, yeah. you know Another method employed in the 16th century was n- known as the estrapade. And that's when a heretic had chains secured from the waist. And, it, oh, this was another way of being burned at the stake. It's called an estrapade. It's ba- and this was reserved for heretics. So what would, it be, what would happen is uh, they'd tie a chain around the heretic's waist and they would attack that chain to a crane like structure and that would enable the victim to just basically get dipped into flames brought back out dipped into flames and then brought back out again is he ready yet <laughs> ah, fucking hell. so yeah there's that and the last one for this episode is burned internally. Oh, Jesus Christ. Internal burning was rare was a rare method where molten lead or liquid tar would get ladled down the throat of the condemned. What the fuck? Like what the actual fuck? Yeah. What was wrong with these people? I uh, I know. I know. So here's a mini story that has nothing to do with uh getting poured get get like basically drinking molten lead or liquid tar but everything to do with being burned internally this is a mini story of edward the second of england and isabella uh, 82 yeah uh isabella daughter of king philip uh the fourth of spain yeah i know her well <laughs> isabella basically got entangled with some guy named roger mortimer earl of march and he happened to be one of Edward's enemies. Edward didn't care very much because he, at the end of it all, preferred the company of men anyway. So, yeah, I was thinking he was probably just gay and this was all a big arranged thing. All right. Yeah. So Isabella, with her son, said, fuck you. And, you know, I got Roger anyway. So I'm going to dip on out to France. And she did so. And while she was away, King Edward was captured by Mortimer and he was tortured and put to death by the insertion of a red hot iron up his butt. Wow. I'm guessing they knew he was gay. Yeah, and this was like Yeah. Yeah. Well. So that's all for this this episode and I'll commence I'll I'll do you know I'll continue this, I mean, on to the next one. I want to find out more dramatics like that. It's like <laughs> Desperate Housewives of Medieval <laughs> Times. All right. Well, I guess it's time for our listener's story. Oh, yeah. Actually, I'm going to shout out Lexi. Lex E. Mm-hmm. Her Instagram handle is October, October all, all year. year uh, yeah. Underscore. She's our friend. Yeah. And her Instagram is dope AF, as the kids say um but yeah she's very supportive and i don't know yeah but what else like supportive and interactive yeah on instagram which we really appreciate yeah she's always shouting us out which we really like yeah like we love having that interaction yeah i mean she like it means someone out there likes us yeah (laughs) (laughs) and we thrive on positive reinforcement (laughs) So, our listener story this week, from Reddit username Hidden Love Arcade. I had my first encounter today. So, I was out and about with my wife, and we were getting some groceries at Walmart. I noticed this man, about age 40 to 45. He was staring at me from across the aisle, and I just ignored him. I looked back at him as we were walking towards another aisle. He was in the same spot, just looking at me, but had this devilish grin on his face. So I stared back at him, made the big eyeballs face, to let him know I was, to let him know I knew he was being rude and staring. So, 
We go into the next aisle and he is there at the other end of it. I have no clue how that's even possible. Since he was at the opposite end of the other aisle when he was staring, it was like he just teleported. So I say to my wife, check that dude out. He's been staring at me for five minutes. And she made a silly joke about how he might think I'm cute or something. I look back at the guy and the devilish grin he had has not changed and stretched, has now changed and stretched from ear to ear like the Joker or something. Freaked me the fuck out. I said, look at him. And my wife looked over in his direction and said he was just standing there, nothing odd about him. And that he seemed to be looking for someone or waiting on someone. I looked back at him and his entire head had turned dark green and looked, I shit you not, just like a lizard. Red eyes and all. It wasn't a Halloween mask and no, I'm not on any drugs or alcohol. (laughs) I walked away in the other direction with my wife saying, where are you going? Anyways, this felt like he wanted me to see him. I can't get the image out of my head. Weird. That is weird. So that's definitely a different fucking yeah, I like type that. of story. Yeah. I don't know how I feel about like I always make jokes about, you know, the royal family and like politicians are shipping like lizard or reptilians and stuff. Yeah. But you want to know the funny thing about that? It's no joke. Ah, uh, yeah, because they're really fucking reptilians. All right, right, creeps. (laughs) I guess that about wraps it up. Um, Please be sure to. Oh, that is actually really weird. We just got a follow on Instagram. As I said, that story of Mr. Reaps Reptiles. Yeah, Yeah. I'm telling you, man, we're getting closer to the fucking truth. (laughs) They're listing out there. Um. Anyway, I do have one big favor for all of our Apple podcast listeners, which is actually the majority of our listeners Mm -hmm. um, listen on Apple Podcasts. Please leave us a uh, five star rating and a review because that really helps, apparently. Yeah, I feel okay. That's very fucking important, especially right now, because I want feedback. Yeah, because constructive if, feedback. Don't be a dick. <laughs> All right. Um. Yeah, but we want to know what you want, basically, from us. Like yeah. more of this or less of that. And yeah. Do you like so this episode? We, you know, it's a little chatty. It's a little more high energy than they normally are. Do you dig that? Do you don't? Do you like my do monogamous? Huh? Do you don't? Yeah. <laughs> do you like my monogamous droll or do you like this? like when i'm hopped up on fucking monster because if it is you know what i'm saying then we'll work around that yeah yeah like basically what because we can do a whole ton of really interesting but quite sad stories or we can try and keep it we do try and keep it as light as possible i'm gonna edit most of this out anyway leave us a rating and review on um itunes it helps a lot also we are looking into getting merch started we're probably just going to start small with stickers and stuff like that um what what i would eventually want though is where we would come out with a line of butcher knives and on the side of the blade it could say weekly creep that would be cool that would be cool yeah so for only four hundred (laughs) dollars plus shipping and tax uh you can have a custom weekly creep butcher knife um, but yeah, don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Twitter. I'm getting better at Twitter. Uh, Facebook, I'm still terrible at it, but I share all the stuff from Instagram on there. Um, because Mark Zuckerberg is the devil. Yeah. And he owns it all. Uh, I don't fucking know. Oh, YouTube, watch the videos and shit. And thanks everybody for sticking with us so far. This is episode 11. And yeah, don't forget, we have a a bonus episode coming out this month for All Hallows Eve. Or Samhain. Or Samhain, yeah, which we can't wait for either, uh, with some special guests and shit. Okay, bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.